a very warm welcome to the Power Hour session. We are delighted to have with us Dr. Pooja Paswan. She is an alumni of the Indian Navy School, John F. Kennedy School of Government, Harvard University. Dr. Pooja Paswan is an assistant professor in the Department of Political Science at the renowned and India's third best university, Jamia Millia Isyamia, and is a faculty member with an excellent teaching experience of 12 years. Dr. Paswan has done her bachelor's in English honors, master's in public administration, and a PhD in public administration. She specializes in public policy and ethics and governance, and is also an associate fellow at the Indian Institute of Advanced Study. She has backed a wreath of titles, including the American Society for Public Administration, Founders Fellow, the class of 2019. She was also the recipient of the American Society for Public Administration, the International Young Scholar Program, the class of 2017, to name a few. Having worked extensively in the work in the field of uh, development, public administration and public policy, she is currently the book review editor at the International Journal of Public Administration, IGPA, Rootlet Publications. Dr. Paswan is also an associate director at the Talotama Foundation, a global think tank focusing on global politics, security relations and administrations. She is the author of the book, Financial Administration of India, 2015 and many other articles. Apart from that, her areas of interest include administrative law, international relations, disaster management, and Buddhist studies. That's quite a lot, Dr. Paswan. We welcome you once again, and we look forward to hearing from you. Over to you. Thank you, uh, Sopra Stera, for having me. The topic that I will be speaking on is uh, women at the helm of change. So these were some statistics that I pulled out for the sake of discussion, that when we're talking about female workforce or female uh, uh, leadership in private workforce, it's, it's a very dismal uh, uh, performance, like less than 50%. But then the argument comes, should you have representation only on the basis of, the basis of diversity that would compromise the performance of a company? Private sector in Western countries would not, you know, so, but, they do offer positions of diversity for the heck of diversity, like uh, you have positions reserved, not reserved, but uh, uh, you will find people in the boardroom from Hispanic community, from uh, uh, American, uh, African community, from uh, a certain other minority community, Asian community for that matter, South Koreans, Chinese, Japanese, and then again, several, several minority communities, South Asians, for the, just for the sake of representation, but they do not compromise on quality. So when we talk about 50% rep representation in parliament, we understand that the parliament reservation is based on uh, election. The ability for people to vote, like you enough to vote for you. So when we're looking at this particular figure in private sector or also in public sector, we say that these many seats reserved for women, but that might end up hampering the performance of the organization. Also, when women and men tend to choose a particular position, a job, Men look at pay scale. How much am I getting paid? Because at the hindsight, you have to support a family, support yourself, etc. But women look at how much of free time do I have access to? Again, what Shubra said, it's all about, uh, you know, uh, the other auxiliary activities that we do find ourselves attached with. But again, the same scenario in a Western country is that if you're an employee in a European company in Europe, you will get weekends free to do your laundry, to do your chores, to run for groceries, to look after your kids. All that work is done during weekend and nobody can email you, not even your boss can reach out to you during the weekend. Whereas here, you can get into the hustle culture because there is a housewife taking care of everything at home. What about somebody, a woman, who's keeping up promotions because she has family responsibility or forget family responsibility, but you know, other agendas of her own, you know, hobbies to pursue and things like that. How many women have the luxury to pursue hobbies? Your free time is usually dedicated towards family. So when we look at leadership from that particular perspective, 
and particularly women in leadership of that particular perspective, certain jobs are very lucrative for women. Like women gen will most of the time apply for HR or finance position because there are certain jobs that do not require you to travel as much, do not put you in a decision-making power, and also people tend to trust you. You know, in HR, you'll have to listen to people. Again, women tend to apply for teaching positions. But there is one exercise I often do in my class that I ask my students to picture uh, the teaching profession. But when you picture a teacher, you imagine a female teacher. And when I say professor, you imagine a, you imagine a male professor, a male entity. You know, similarly, surgeons. A gynae, you would imagine a female doctor, but a neurologist or a cardiologist, you would imagine uh, a male doctor. So that's, again, those kind of gender biases do exist. And if there is a female cardiologist, head of cardiology, suddenly you find you will go online and look up at her credential that see, is she really worth saving my life or should I go and consult a different doctor? We all do that and believe me, people in the West also do that. And in fact, uh, like this time when I was uh, a faculty, I was teaching at a uh, university. So uh, there was this one student uh, who then said that uh, the number of female faculties in mathematics department in United States, particularly in statistics, is zero because a uh, mathematics department requires a commitment publication, which is higher than the commitment, academic commitment required in social science discipline. So political science, public policy, sociology, you will find far more women as opposed to mathematics or statistics or computing and things like that. You know, so here comes the basis you know, uh, of choices that women tend to opt for disciplines which are more comfortable and will help them uh, you know, uh, develop their personality will leave room for family uh, responsibilities, et cetera, et cetera. Right, uh, the next slide. So this was one study where women and leadership, the roles were defined and challenged, uh, and this was published in HBR, Harvard Business Review. Although women score very high on leadership roles, but having said that, like I said, uh, in diplomacy, we use the term hard power and soft power. Hard power is when governments interact with each other at the ministerial level, at the defense level. Soft power is when governments interact with each other at cultural level. So currently the G20 activity that you see all over India, that's the India showcasing soft power. And also through soft power, we tend to achieve more uh, benefit of interaction with different, different countries. Like uh, Indo-Pakistan cricket matches that we saw during Atul Bihari Vajpayee's time. Then you have several cultural exchange, Indo-Russia cultural exchange, Indo-France cultural, cultural exchange. That's the mention for the display of soft power. But in leadership, or particularly in a family, when you, husband and wife both have to exhibit leadership to run the family, we often say that the man in the organization is that depicts the hard part, where it takes tougher decision and you know things like that. Whereas the woman depicts soft power. You know, so she goes interacts with uh, everybody. She calms down. Uh, she she uh, calms down and she maintains peace at home or a particular harmony at home or in the workplace. There's also an observation, uh, and actually this is my own personal observation, I could be wrong, but I remember uh, I was serving under uh, Professor Kudlur Savitri who, joined, our who uh, joined as the head of the department during COVID. And we instantly saw a change in the leadership. You know, she initiated that uh, there should be a pantry in the department and when we want tea or coffee, we don't have to send the pew to run to the canteen and get a uh, refreshment for the uh, any guest or any uh, uh, person coming and delivering lecture in the department. The small, small changes, softer changes that she made, made day-to-day -day easier for us. Whereas the earlier head of the department would think that, okay, we need to sign an MOU with this particular university. He would work on a broader picture, whereas she made things very easier for us in the department for everybody to work and the navigation with each other or, you know, different, different MA programs became very easier. So when we do see women tend to excel in leadership because they network better. Women tend to enter, uh, excel in leadership because they tend to, in, they excel in the uh, uh, informal communication network. I'm, I don't want to use the word gossip, but <laughs> men gossip as well. Although, but uh, then again, the informal channel of network, which thrives in an organization, believe me, and I'm not contributing it to just to women, but uh, informal channel of network is important, not just uh, through grapevine or anything, but then interaction with different, different, different uh, departments, the way they can approach 
a different department informally as well, they have a broader expand of uh, reaching out to people as opposed to a man who would be formal, who would be very straight jacketed in his approach or something like that. So here comes the argument that they do excel, they score very high in leadership competency, but are they provided with the opportunity because there is a shadow of doubt that she will get into a family way or she will be required to fulfill certain uh, um, uh, household duties. I, I, uh, there was one um, seminar in my university which was being held by a Center for Women's Studies and there was this one professor, she was the director of MDI University, Gurgaon. She said that if my child scores poorly in the exam, I am blamed because I am working very hard. Although I and my husband, we both work equal hours and I work for lesser, he was in a private sector, she was in academic. But if he performs badly, my family says, just because you did not give him, you did not devote much time to his work or his studies and you devoted more time to your work, and hence, see, look at his performance. But that argument is never given in front of a, you know, is never given to a man, you know. But then that's a cultural bias, right? Put yourself in United States where you're working in a private organization, your husband will be doing the dishes, your husband will be doing the, uh, uh, you know, will be cleaning the house equally as you will be because the rent is very high, $3,000 a month or $4,000 a month is quite steep, you know, with the salary that they provide, the parable salary, that they provide. The groceries are very uh, expensive, so you will get a Costco card or something to get your groceries during uh, weekends. Your weekends will be reserved for household work, meal preparation, everything, so that your week can go smoothly. But here you have the option of blanket everything, everything, and people at home who will do it for you. You know, All that scenario compared with the leadership of running an organization is different. So we are culturally different. Then again, uh, Tarun, the next slide. So, like I said, women tend to be more democratic, more participative, get, try getting an argument with a, a, a woman, you know, uh, or, or uh, just, just, see how, just ask a police officer, a traffic cop, how many women has he chalan? She can get out of a chalan very easily. So, you know, I'm going to class, but I'm going to go and all that. I was getting late and all that. I can literally bargain that I will not pay 500, but it may not be like that. But a man has to go to work and all that. Make you do and suddenly the ego comes in, you know, on the forefront. Forget that, but in an organization as well, in terms of in uh, uh, conflict between colleagues, we tend to find that HR, which is being headed by a woman, she will look for a way that, you know, we can sort out the matter, we can arrange a compromise, we can mediate in a way that both the parties will feel that they have been taken care of or will have a sense of, uh, you know, closure about that argument. I'm not saying men don't perform that well, but uh, different universities, their relationship manager is a woman. Like Brown University, the relationship manager was a woman. Harvard University, Kennedy School, the relationship manager was a woman. You know, it's, what I'm trying to tell you is that it's they happen to be more di diplomatic, they happen to be more democratic, it's more engaging. So like my program, there was a, a one a woman, she was a female judge, and uh, we had a simulation where we had to look, we had to advise the uh, finance minister whether to stop the funding to Somalia, because we had a lot of policy leaks. And there were five, six of us in that particular uh, group assignment. The... Uh, Four of us were women, and when we were negotiating, negotiating, and we were trying to work through the simulation, and in the end, we came to the conclusion that we will stop the funding of Somalia and we will uh, reissue another policy which will look at the leakages. Whereas the group assignment, which was given to men, they were more compassionate. All right, let's increase the funding. Leakages don't matter, but we have to take care of those uh, people, the beneficiaries, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So our professor, during the evaluation, he gave, he awarded us more marks. He said, all right, all women, but in terms of practicality, getting the work done, and we tend to feel that women have a softer heart. You know, she's, she's, she's more emotionally attached to the target, and hence she will take a decision that will, uh, that will be more humane in nature. Not that our decision was not humane, but it was practical. You know, it was practical in terms of saving the funds of the country. It was also practical in terms of making policy adjustments, which was required. So what I'm trying to tell you is, in terms of democratic, these tendencies, democratic 
tendencies or participative attitude has nothing to do with the fact that you're a man or a woman. It has to do with the fact that how seriously you take your work or job at the helm of the leadership. So next slide. Like I said, this is a study. This is a 2020 study and this has been researched. And uh, again, the people who participated in the study were employed in private sectors, academics. So their sample size of the universe of the study is then again, people who uh, were mostly uh, employed in the West, you know? But then again, I, like I said, I had to take up a, a study which is authentic in nature. So some women do feel that they are overlooked in the times of crisis. Forget the fact that uh, uh, at the time of a crisis, the board makes a certain decision. I, I remember once uh, there was a, there was one position in the department uh, for which uh, this colleague of mine, she was overlooked and we had just joined. This was like 10 years back, uh, 11 years back, we had just joined. And what she did, instead of being upset about that particular position, she started applying in different, different, different positions, different, different responsibilities, fellowships outside of India. So now when you actually speak to her, she said, thank God I didn't get that opportunity because had I been given that particular opportunity, I would have been country bound, but that trauma helped me to get out of it and start gain opportunities that I would have never thought that I will be applying to or I, I would have never thought I will have access to. So maybe what you think is crisis is just a, you know, a, 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 a bump on the road that that is to lead you somewhere else. The next. So that's that's the study. The next slide. That's the study of uh, uh, HBR. When we're looking at. Uh, no, no, no. Previous slide. This one? No, previous slide. This one? That was an awesome. Yeah, this one. So when we are looking at uh, leadership in general, like I said, leadership is gender neutral. So when we are looking at leadership, um, we tend to look at one aspect of self-awareness. So in uh, Buddhism, there is a meditation practice called Vipassana. And uh, Vipassana is basically a 10 day retreat where you don't speak, you observe a 10 day morn, you meditate for a good nine hours and you're on a sattvic diet. It's a good retreat. It's, it's something that everybody should experience. And uh, in that particular period, you are taught through breathing exercises, through meditation, you're taught self-awareness. Now, when you're in a position of leadership, it's not about some people might think that leadership and authority is governing others and telling what others telling others what to do but leadership is also a journey into self uh, you know making a self res uh, reflection so through self awareness you can assess what is your emotional range as to what disturbs you what triggers you and what are the sensitive areas where you feel that uh, you need to overcome through the opportunity of being in this particular leadership position because Somebody said leadership, uh, being in a position of leadership is a privilege, but it's an opportunity to rediscover yourself. You know, whether you're in a position of leadership or in any position in an uh, institution, as you move up, you're not the same person, you know, in the next, in the previous promotion, you're not the same person with the next job title. So reorganizing, recognizing your range of emotion is very important because that would help you or that would prompt you to play a more effective role, not just as a leader, but also as a member of the organization. So let's just say that, so A or X or B or man or a woman comes into a role of a leadership. Suddenly we say that the, the person's attitude has changed. The woman's attitude, attitude has changed. She's become more authoritative. She's become more uh, assertive. She's become more, uh, uh, you know, uh, she's, she's telling people what to do. It's not that. It's just the self-awareness of her emotion and recognizing that, this leadership position comes with these responsibility, these deadlines, and the expectation of the organization or the trust of the organization for me to deliver those targets. Then self-management. Again, we're looking at emotional and social competency inventory. This aspect of uh, a leadership is very important. So there is a managerial grid that we often practice in uh, pub uh, public policy and uh, leadership class at Harvard. And that particular grid helped us mapping our emotional pattern. Like in a particular situation, I would be angry, but if I am heading that particular situation, I cannot afford to be angry. I have to keep calm and look for solution and also manage the emotions of the said employee who have the luxury of getting angry, you know, but I don't. 
So then self-management or effectively managing your emotions at the helm of a particular institution is important, whether you're a man, whether you're a woman. Social awareness, understanding the nature of the organization. See, I teach in a centrally funded government institution. And my university has a reservation for 50% reservation for Muslims. And having said that, it does not, the culture of the university is very different from Delhi University or Jawaharlal Nehru University. Now, if I were to present or expect the students to behave or have that cultural openness or a cultural mindset of a student of Delhi University, then I'm fooling myself and I'm making my job harder. But if I make an assessment of the uh, environment and if I make that through that assessment, I know that what is expected out of me and what should be my expectations out of the environment, then my journey will be very smooth whether I'm heading the uh, organization or I, whether I'm a part of the organization. So uh, uh, there was one uh, in one of the incidences, like I was teaching, uh, I was taking a class at uh, uh, State University of New York in uh, Buffalo. And there were, there were several students, you know, in MA, uh, you find students from various different, different ages because master's program is open to uh, all the students, you know, regardless of the ages, regardless of people, whether they're working. And, uh, there were students, Hispanics, and different, different, different set cultures, and they had a very different notion of India. So somebody said that Dr. Paswan in India, is it true that, uh, you know, uh, it's unsafe for women and, you know, things like that? Yes, but it's not unsafe as, uh, you know, exceptionally unsafe. New York is unsafe for women, you know. Boston, if you were to venture out after in the dark hours, it's unsafe for women. Even in New York, if you're in the downtown area, or if you are in the Queens or Brooklyn, it's unsafe for everybody, not just women, but for everybody. Your chances of getting mugged are higher in New Jersey. So as opposed to, it's all about perception, you know? So when I, and my uh, uh, colleague who was my host at that university, she told me, look, this is the demography. These are the students and they come from this, this, this background. And unlike in India, where MPA student would sit for a civil service exam or something, they will enter the government, they will enter private sector, they will work in city hall, they will work with mayor. And all these people do have a very constricted mindset because they haven't traveled well or they are not very well read. So you have to justify culturally and you will have to break some myths. So it's all about understanding the organization um, and the environment of the organization. Then, uh, the relationship management. We often see that uh, uh, managing, inspiring emotions to achieve common goals. The idea is mentoring goes a long way. Um, the fellowship which uh, uh, Deepthi mentioned uh, was awarded by the American Society for Public Administration. It's a mentoring fellowship where the fellows from this particular year will mentor fellows from the next year to occupy positions of leadership or they are grooming the people to occupy uh, uh, positions as a treasurer of some section on new public administration or section on women and public administration or section on women and South Asia uh, public administration. But we mentor students or uh, new professionals to join and grow, uh, we groom these professionals to join the next line of leadership. You know, and that's how uh, you ensure that the organization will have a longer life as life expectancy as opposed to somebody you're bringing in a leader or somebody from outside and people feel imposed by their leaderships so you know a relationship manager when we relationship manager we talk about uh, mentoring which i do discuss in the other slide as well is is absolutely very important so emotional and social competency, this, is, uh, this, was a very, this was a core program in leadership at Harvard, where we, we saw that how it's not about organizing and collating different, different institutions and them working with each other, but also changing yourself for you to work in a different, in the same organization at a different role. You know, you will be very different when you have just joined and you will be very different. You will behave very different when you have served for a good number of years, because you have examples to set, you have people to mentor, you have uh, responsibilities to fulfill, and all of that add to the whole persona of uh, uh, the leadership. Next slide. So HBR also published uh, research on the role men can play in empowering women. Like I said, we are not victimizing women and we are not discussing uh, gender biases. But uh, in an organization, like I said, we saw the statistics, 35% women workforce and this is 
this could be by default, this could be by design. But if you look at uh, teaching at primary level, women outdo men. If you look at uh, uh, women in uh, Gaine, uh, women outdo men. So certain areas, women, there is a surplus of women, and this is also by choice. Again, I'm giving the example in Boston, there are several, several clubs. So during weekends, the uh, the uh, embassy, the Italian embassy and, and the uh, Spanish embassy, they hold salsa classes. So in one of the classes, there was one Harvard pre-med student. And this is very unusual for a pre-med student for a hobby class. And he was an Asian American. And uh, he was very, very uh, uh, well versed with the moves and everything. So I, I asked him that, how do you find time? He was a male student. So I said, how do you find time? And he had come with his colleagues, classmates. So he said, this particular activity helps me deconnect, disconnect from what I do in general, from my studies. And this also helps me with my mobility, you know, because uh, in, in salsa, it's not like Bollywood dancing that you're throwing your arms and legs around, but it's, it's very controlled. You have to keep your body in control. And while in surgery, you have to keep your hands in control. It cannot shake. It cannot move even a millimeter. It, it's very important. So he said, this helps me with my focus. There are other people I remember my uh, uh, my colleague at Richmond, uh, who was hosting me, she said that she uh, she's a trek junkie. She often goes on natural treks, and she often puts herself in a very uncomfortable situation. You know, going on treks in uh, 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 during snowfall, trekking at a higher altitude, just to sharpen her mind, just to make sure that you know, in case of a challenging situation, I want to keep myself calm, and this is the way I do it. Now her mentor or her head of the department understands. So her classes has been, have been put in a hybrid mode so that she can pursue her hobby or whatever she needs to do in order to hone her skills. And her head of the department is essentially a man. But what I'm trying to tell you is that male advocacy of understanding that yes, all the counterparts, whether man or a woman, have a certain role, you know, to play, essential role to play in order to ensure a gender parity. That a male member in your office should not assume that she's a woman, she has to go back, she's going, she's taking time off because she has to spend time with the family. What if she wants to just disconnect and recharge in a retreat in the hills? Or what if she wants to pursue her uh, uh, hobby of classical music, you know, or, uh, uh, you know, go for meditation or something of that sort? What about that? So have, understanding that aspect is really important. So that's how the role men can play in making sure that women feel part of the organization while they're at the organization without feeling threatened, you know, or without feeling too conscious of the fact that they are women and they, they, they need to make certain excuses in order to pursue their activities. I'm not feeling so well, I'm not here, I, I just can't come today, whatever, but instead I would like to go, but you don't tell your boss, but you go for a retreat or something. Tell him that I need this much of time to recharge, and this will help me perform better. You know, the next is mentorship and uh, sponsorship. This is undoubtedly the most uh, important important aspect. Mentorship, whether you're grooming the next line of leadership, man or a woman. Personally, Tarun is my school senior, and I have seen him groom, particularly uh, women employees. You know, during uh, British Business Group events or Sopra Stira events. And I remember, I think, one of the uh, India Global Foundation, when I saw that the PR work was being done by a female employee, I said, I'm quite impressed, you know, that he delegates as much as to female employees. You know, the more you delegate, delegation is a sign of trust, that you trust the person that they will do the job well. You trust the person that they will not, even if they don't, uh, or even if they fumble, you are there to guide them, you know? So when you... Trust somebody, you will delegate as much as possible. And through delegation, you can perform the activity of grooming the person or the next line of leadership as well. Right? Then and all male advocacy, mentoring and sponsorship then leads to the challenging of unconscious biasness. We are human beings. We are raised in a particular culture. Biasness cannot, we can never be unbiased. And there are certain biases will be, that will be sub, sorry, subconsciously uh, in our minds. So, uh, in a PhD, we often talk about researcher bias, that you might come from a certain area, certain background, certain you might have a certain schooling, certain city that you might come from, certain conservative family that you might come from, but while doing a data collection, you have to be as unbiased as possible. So do not assume that because you're working on women, 
studies or because you're working on women uh, uh, performance in a particular organization, you naturally assume or automatically assume they are victims or, you know, they are uh, uh, discriminated or what if she's not performing because she does not want to perform? You know, that could also be the case. What if, uh, you know, her interests lie somewhere else and she happens to be in this particular role because she is still yet discovering and trying to get there? You know, all these aspects. So when we talk about unconscious bias, um, sadly, the Indian judicial system and also culture in the uh, organization, whether public or private, is so strict that we naturally assume if somebody has said something, it might mean something otherwise. And often we tend to weaponize or victimize certain issues, particularly of gender issues, in, in the favor of ourselves or to harm somebody else. Like there have been several cases, false cases of dowry and false cases of, uh, you know, for, during divorces. So what, I will not get into that. But what, what I'm trying to say that there is always a challenging subconscious biasness that I have seen male academics or male professors, they are very careful of uh, taking a female PhD scholar. You know, what if if a PhD is not completed, she does not submit chapters on time, and if I ask her to do a course, she might file a harassment case against me or something of that. So there, there, there are cases, you know, and subconsciously, that fear dictates them not to take a good candidate. Similarly, in case of, it, it works the other way around as well you know, both nationally and internationally. So at male advocacy, mentorship, that does help in challenging the subconsciousness bias to add, you know, in the workplace, the next thing. <clears throat> this is my last slide, I promise. Then again, uh, allyship in action, you know. So uh, promoting women's uh, ideas, promoting... Uh, 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 Promoting the said diversity, not just ideas or ideologies of, uh, uh, of you know, discrimination against women or, uh, uh, you know, things like that, but promoting said ideology that uh, this workplace or this particular environment is conducive to both. And if it is coming from a male leadership, it creates an atmosphere of reassurance because, uh, see, there have been bad female bosses as well which will torment everybody. I mean, who will torment everybody? There have been cases of that. There are people, it, it's a personal thing. It has nothing to do with the fact that whether you're a man or a woman, you know, you might have a said agenda, you might be bitter over something and things like that. So uh, being an ally in action always helps, like I said, in trust building of an organization. Then role modeling, work-life balance. Work-life balance, uh, I, I often feel this particular phrase, work-life balance. Uh, you know, it is, uh, women tend to flock towards this phrase more, whereas men need to perform work-life balance more. Because in the mindset, like I said, the unconsciousness bias, they get into a hustle culture or hustle mode automatically the moment they join organization. And which is very, uh, 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 you know, uh, uh, harming. It, it has a harming effect on their well-being as well. You know, what if a man wants to take time off from technology and go into a retreat? Mental peace is for everybody, not just women. Uh, it's me uh, mental peace is for men as well. Mental health uh, uh, productivity is for men as well. So when we're looking at role modeling, work-life balance, it's not about just women who needs to balance her work, uh, work and her personal life, but it's also men who needs to balance their work and personal life, give time to their family or give time to themselves. You know, and through that, you know, by the virtue of that, uh, uh, action, you know, you can set a better example. Like, uh, again, there was one student of mine, this is way back, five, six years back, and he was in defense. So he joined the MBA program, and I asked him that, uh, uh, you know, you're taking time off, and he was in service, in government service. So I said, you're taking time off, study leave to do this particular course, what will you do with the degree? So he said that defense life was so strenuous. And he said, I wanted time to, I wanted some time to spend with my family and also spend with myself. I want to learn, I want to read, and I never get that opportunity while I'm serving. And I cannot do both. And in order for me to be sane, mentally sane, I need this break. So how many men go for a sabbatical which is provided to them by the university? Like a university in India, Central University in India, there is a provision that you can go for a sabbatical after seven years of service. 
not many men take that sabbatical but in western countries nobody leaves their sabbatical sabbatical is paid by the university nobody will leave their sabbatical whether you're a man or a woman sabbatical is my time i will go travel to a different country i will write a book i will write a research paper i will read 10 books this is my time so guarding your personal time is important and if men can do it with us you know an example we should normalize guarding our personal time we should normalize the fact that we need time for mental peace and that kind of a work culture will uh, uh, you know create automatically create a gender balance you know like mental peace is for everybody mental uh, 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 personal time is for everybody for that matter and then creating self uh, safe and respectful workplace if all the criteria above are met you know you guard your personal time you you uh, uh, you, you mentor the female uh, all the employees forget female or male you know and then of course naturally that's the aftermath and here i'm going to stop Wow, that was quite exhaustive. And I must say that, you know, the points that you mentioned about male advocacy and, uh, you know, men having to improve uh, and work upon the work-life balance aspect that women have been hearing all their lives is something very interesting. I would like to have some viewpoints from all the attendees out there in person and who have joined us virtually. It's just so I wanted to go... Uh, like uh, what is your feedback on gender uh, diversity do you think corporates should have gender diverse candidates gender diverse candidates diversity candidates gender diversity candidates you should have a criteria first like you know these many years of work experience depending on your intake like uh, in universities we do have uh, reservations but we don't compromise on cutoff so in corporate if you're, let's say, looking for a project manager, he or she should have these many years of work ex. He or she should have stellar recommendation from previous employees. He or, sorry, she should have, or gender, gender diversity can work in uh, favor of men as well. So again, he or, we're talking about gender diversity, not favoring women only. No, no, I meant gender diversity candidates, like females. Okay. If you have same qualification, male and female, hmm. Same number of experience, project manager role. Mm. But uh, if companies promote gender diversity, should they then be biased on the female candidates? What are your thoughts? Private companies cannot afford to be biased towards female candidates or uh, 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 have that kind of uh, uh, intake solely on the fact that she's a woman. But if she meets the cutoff, then yes. You know, if she meets the said cutoff, she has stellar recommendation from your uh, from the previous company. She has worked in other companies, particularly competition. You know, then uh, and if she does uh, perform well at the interview, I believe you have first, second, third interviews, couple of stages. So if she does through all that, then yes. But having said that, uh, I I do know for a fact that uh, bringing in diversity, we are just talking about gender diversity. You know, and uh, see, in India, you're looking at from a lens of man and a woman. You know, you're not looking at other genders, the third gender and other genders, because the society is very constricted. But if you go outside, you know, you have people from all, every, every section of the society, and that society is very diverse to begin with. It's not just Hispanics and different, different nationalities, but it's also people with different orientations. You know, not just man and a woman, but different orientations. So when you bring in that kind of diversity, you also bring in those viewpoints, which makes the work environment and work culture very open for anybody to come and accommodate themselves. You know, so if let's say your workplace has a high ratio of men as opposed to women, then it is fair for you to bring in more women in order to strike that balance. So that a woman coming into your workplace should not feel that they're only men, they only talk to themselves, and men are scared to over-interact with a woman in case she thinks uh, I'm being over-friendly or I should protect myself or something of that sort. But if you have a fair balance, a judicial balance, then that interaction, that flow of interaction, that flow of communication will be easier. So if if the ratio in your organization is skewed in one way or other, more women then get more men. Uh, so he wants to know some tips on uh, dealing with uh, somewhat extremely hard, uh, um, you know, hard to deal with managers. Well, see, I, I remember we had this one uh, colleague 
uh, who became the head of the department while she was and she was a professor and uh, uh, while she was a professor all the assistant professors like the junior colleagues we were very scared to approach her like professor savitri we don't want to approach her she's she was strict she was the best in her field she was achieving scholar she was a fulbright scholar she had excellent publications and uh, her research scholars were also like uh, very well groomed you know because she would look at every comma and every punctuation on their thesis when she became the head of the department we saw a huge change i mean she was the head of the department only for 4 months she expired during covid in office i god bless her soul but the changes that she introduced we saw her very differently in a very different light and she was she became more approachable so we're talking about managers she became very approachable we could talk to professor savitri regarding rescheduling our classes or changes in the syllabus or the way we want to uh, uh, teach you know <laughs> Thank you. 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 Thank yeah but it, it all depends on the uh, initiation uh, uh, you know the initiative which companies take in order to bridge that gap and uh, i don't think you should bridge the gap solely for uh, showing numbers because if you do that then you're seriously compromising on your performance so by 2025 that kind of an no i mean we are still we should not make estimates so close 5 trillion economy by certain year is also uh you know it's an estimate so i don't know i don't want to make an estimate and then not see it happening i can't really say that yet. uh thank you deepthi so i would like to start off by thanking dr paswan for delivering such a wonderful and inspiring session the insights that you have shared were very thought provoking and transformative in nature to be honest it was uh, truly a power hour in all sense like for me and all the colleagues that are attending uh, this session uh, moving forward i would like to thank all our colleagues who have joined this session from various locations and i would like to extend a digital applause for being an active part of this power hour on women empowerment making it a lot more engaging for everyone lastly i would like to conclude this episode by quoting a statement a small statement by michelle obama so here it is uh, there is no limit to what we as women can accomplish so this entire statement is solely means uh, that sky might be the limit for men but not for women so on that i would like uh, to call an end to this episode thank you all for joining in see you soon in in our next power hour session so thank you all so we will now begin with the felicitations there uh, may i request uh, Murari and Nusha to please uh, hand over the certificate and souvenir. Thank you so much, Dr. Fasman. Thank you. Thank you.